Hey guys, it's Lane Blake from Refund Horizons, and this is the next video we're doing in our series on Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles. It's kind of the surveying Bible. Uh, it captures a lot of what's in the common law about boundary surveying and puts that in a textbook, for, textbook format for surveyors. So in this video, I want to go over chapter two. Thankfully, chapter two was not as confusing for me as chapter one. And after 20 years actually reading Browns, I learned a couple important things in chapter two. Uh, so that was great. I'm glad that I'm doing this. I'm, it's benefiting me. I hope it's benefiting you. It's benefiting me too. And uh, chapter two is really important. Uh, it talks about some kind of key concepts that set the foundation of, of uh, being a good boundary surveyor. So uh, it's definitely it's something that we want to go through. So again... I've got the study notes online. They've got a bunch of key terms. I'm not going to go through those. We're going to go to the key concepts. Now, this is uh, because this, this, the concepts in Chapter 2 are so fundamental, I, w I really wanted to make sure that, that you guys understood them, uh, you know, that you understood the difference between an original corner and an original monument and a retracement monument and between an original controlling survey and a retracement survey and what a first retracement survey is. So what I did is I put together some videos on the computer with some exhibits, and they're not super fancy. I'm not a you know professional animator or anything like that, but um, I, did, I, I did a couple of supplemental videos. So watch those before you watch this, um, before you watch this main video, because I think that'll help you. I'm not going to sketch a bunch to try and explain these concepts, because I'm trying to do that in the video, those supplemental videos. I think I'm going to do one more supplemental video, supplemental video where I talk about the difference between a property corner and a monument, because I think that would be good on, on the computer with an exhibit too. So watch those other supplemented, supplemental videos before you watch this main video, okay? All right, so Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles Chapter 2. Uh, like I said, really fundamental ideas there that we need to understand. Uh, I found a couple things in there that I didn't necessarily agree with. I may point those out as we move through here, but it's really good stuff. So here's the first key concept. In chapter two, original property corners and original property corner monuments control. Okay, and watch that video if you don't understand what that means. But basically, uh, an original property corner is created on a controlling survey or an original survey. It's what Browns calls an original survey. I usually call it the controlling survey. What that is, it's the survey that creates the parcel. Okay, so usually. In California, that's a parcel map or a, a subdivision map. So it's it's an actual subdivision that's creating a parcel. Okay, so those those maps create original property corners or uh, original property corner monuments. Uh, I will also add that if you're if you're creating parcels by deed, which we don't let you do in California anymore unless you're the government. If you if you're creating parcels by deed, you are also creating original corners. You're not usually creating original corner monuments in that case, unless your written description references monuments that are being set, and it gets a little complicated there. So as a general rule, if you're if you're selling the north half of the east 10 acres by deed, um, you're not doing a survey and actually putting stuff on the ground. Like, that's why people do it. It's cheap. You don't have to do a survey. You can survey it later. Um, so as a general rule, when you're, when you're creating parcels by deed, you're not creating original monuments, you're creating original corners, okay? And to understand that, you got to know the difference between corners and monuments. So there's two ways you can create original corners. You can do it on a subdivision map, okay, which usually creates the corners and the monuments, or you can do it by deed, in which case you're usually only creating the corners by words. You're not, you're, they're usually not being marked by a monument. And of course, there's always exceptions to that rule. Monuments are physical manifestations of a corner. We use that word manifestation, which is kind of abstract. It's not a word we use every day. And it's an object. It's a, it's a metal cap. It's a plastic cap. Uh, it's a disc. It's a rebar. It's a pipe. It's a, it's a wood post. It is a physical object that we're using to mark the corner. An original uh, property corner doesn't have to be marked by a physical monument to control. So an original corner doesn't have to be have a monument to control in your survey, which means, what does that mean from a practical perspective? practical perspective. What that means is you've got to put that original corner back on the ground with some other evidence if it's not marked by a monument. But what Browns is saying is even if it's not marked by a monument, it still controls. That probably needs a sketch. So let's do that real quick. Let's do a sketch. So let's say we've got, uh, let's go back to that example I have. 
So let's say we've got a 20 acre parcel and I'm selling somebody the north half of the east 10 acres. So this is the original parent parcel. Okay, then I'm going to give somebody the north half or the yeah, the north half of the east 10. Okay. So this is the north half. And this is the east 10, right? 10 east 10 acres. What Browns is saying is I just created these two corners here. But if I do that by deed, then I, I, they're probably not marked by a monument. Okay. They still control. These corners still control. So what that means is the retracing survey area is you got to establish them on the ground even though they're not marked by a monument. So let's just say you had a monument here that these four corners were monumented okay, on the 20-acre piece. Well, what, what you do is you'd have to survey these four corners. Okay, and then you figure out, all right, where's this dividing line? It should be halfway. Okay, and where's this dividing line? You know, it should be halfway. Okay, and then you calculate these positions and they control. Okay, even though they're not marked by a monument, they control. What that means is if there's a fence over here five feet, and let's, for the sake of our argument, say it's a new fence, that doesn't control. These corners control, right? And if you sold somebody the north half of the east 10 acres, right, and somebody thought that this was supposed to be, you know, 1,200 feet, because that's what the, how the math worked out. But when you, when you find the four monuments, you measure it's not 1,200, it's 1,220. Okay. Just based on the math, that's where the north half is. And then the distance 1,220 controls because you got to go to that original corner. Okay. So an original corner does not have to be marked by a monument to control. I know that's a little bit confusing. Hopefully this example helped a little bit. These are original corners. They were not marked by a monument. So that there's no original monument. And even if somebody comes in and retraces them and sets monuments there, those still aren't original monuments. They're a retracement monument that purports or claims to mark an original corner. All right. Natural monuments are things like streams, rivers, mountain ridges, toes of slopes, roads, and trees. Those are what we call natural monuments, even though sometimes they're man-made. So a natural monument is not a, a physical marker set to mark one point. It's it's usually a, it's a either a natural feature like a tree or a stone that marks a point, or it's a linear feature like a creek, a river, toe of a slope, uh, or a road. Okay. Natural monuments can be fuzzy in quotes. Browns mentions that, so uh, you can have a deed that says then along the creek. Well, what does that mean? Is it the is it the top of the bank? Is it the edge of water on one side? Is it the center line? Is it the thalweg or the deepest part of the creek? Is it the edge of water on the other side? Is it the top of the bank on the other side? It's ambiguous. That's fuzzy. So Brown says, yeah, natural monuments are fuzzy. What you want to do as a surveyor, is you, if you're using natural monuments, is you don't want to create fuzziness like that, right? You want to be more specific. Objects marked at the time of the survey become the location and identification of the boundary line. So what, what Brown's is saying there is, if a surveyor is physically running a line on the ground, the marks he sets as he, what we call, when, he, when we say runs the line, when he runs the line, those physical marks can be evidence of the line even if the math doesn't work perfectly. So let me give you an example of that because I didn't do it in the video. So let's just say, and you get this in public lands a lot, public land surveys. So let's just say we're running between a section corner and a quarter corner. Okay, and as, as we're going, I'm not going to worry about random lines and true lines here, haters. Okay, because I don't want to overcomplicate things. So let's just assume we're running on, we're running the true the true line. Okay. As the surveyor starts at this corner and heads out, you know he's going to mark things along the line. So he might mark a tree tree on line. He might mark a stone outcropping on line. You know, it depended on the instructions they were working under. Okay, he might call a creek as he crosses. Okay. Now, when you go out and do your field survey, you find out, you find these two corners and survey them, and you find out the tree's actually over here and the stone's a little bit over here, and he doesn't cross the creek till over here. Okay, and these, you know, I don't know, these could be, this could be 20 feet, that could be 5 feet, you know, this could be, this could be uh, 15 feet. Okay. What Browns is saying is, as a retracing surveyor, what you should probably do is you should probably put slight kinks in your line, okay? Because landowners are going to have relied on these physical marks, 
Okay, and their, their occupation, if they built a fence, it's probably going to go to those physical marks because most landowners don't know that the line's kinked, and those physical marks are really important. So what, what Browns is saying is if the original surveyor did that, if he physically marked the line as he went, which is really valuable to the landowners, you you got to use that. Those, those, as a general rule, those objects marked as the line was run control the location of the line. It's not just the location of the corners. It's the location of the objects marked as the lines were run. That's why we come up with that term, run the lines. He's actually running the lines and marking them on the ground. And I believe the, you know, that the BLM manual reflects that principle in, in its instructions. If you find a line, a tree that the surveyor called online, that's going to control the location of the line, whether it's slightly off or not. You know, surveyors like perfect math. That's not the, you know, most landowners aren't worried about perfect math. They, they need physical marks that they can use to control their occupation. That's, that's why that legal principle is the way it is. And it's a good, it's a good legal principle. Okay. The next main concept in Brown's chapter two is that boundary lines and property lines aren't the same thing. I had always used those terms interchangeably. I realized now that was a mistake after 20 years. I really like the distinction that Brown makes. So a boundary line is the dividing line between surveyed parcels or deed parcels. So that's what deed stakers put on the ground. They they put on they put they stake boundary lines per information in the deed. Uh, boundary lines can also be curves. Brown doesn't want to talk about that in chapter two, but I just mentioned that it doesn't have to be a line; it can be a curve. A property line is the dividing line between actual legal ownership, and that can be different from a boundary line. If you don't understand that, watch my supplemental video. I do an example where I try and explain that. So property lines don't always correspond to boundary lines. Sometimes they do, a lot of times they do, even most of the times they do, but they don't always. And property lines can change from boundary lines through the legal principles of estoppel, agreement, and adverse possession. Okay, so I'm going to do a better job of referring to boundary line when I'm talking about the surveyed line on the ground and property line when I'm talking about the limits of ownership, which could change based on some legal principles. So that's in Brown's chapter two. Okay, then he talks about uh, how boundaries are created in chapter two. He talks a lot about that. So he, he talks about four ways that you can create boundaries. So boundaries can be created by action. That includes running lines on the ground, setting monuments, recording field notes, drawing maps. He mentions those actions don't necessarily have to be performed by a land surveyor. Now, most states require that now. But even under in those states, even in a state like California, my understanding is under principles of common law, you know, if, if somebody sells me uh, some property by deed and they go out and they physically mark the line together and agree on where the line is and he sells me that land, you know, he, he does a napkin sketch deed description and goes down and records it um, as, a, as a bona fide purchaser. In other words, if, 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 I don't, if I'm not aware that he's breaking the law and, and I bought that land in good faith, then under the common law in California... I, that could be recognized as a legal parcel, even though it was illegally created. And we also have certificates of, of compliance in California, which help with that. I don't want to get totally lost in the weeds on that, but just understand that in, in, in the old days, and even now in the right circumstances, you don't necessarily have to have a surveyor marking things on the ground to create a parcel boundary. Second way parcels can be created is by words. That's the example I gave you there. You're going to describe something in a deed without physically marking it on the ground. Boundaries can be created by statute. That's the third type. So that's uh, when the government creates boundaries. That's, so the public land survey system in the United States is a great example of that. Um, that the government went out and created a bunch of boundaries uh, by, by actually doing surveys on the ground. Uh, swamp and overflow surveys in, in parts of California, that's where the county or the state went out and surveyed their swamp and overflow lands that they were given by the federal government. Well, that would be another example of, of a boundary created by statute or created by the government. The fourth type is boundaries that, that can be created in the powers of common law. So in some states, there are specific legal requirements that have to be met in statute to do that. Um, for example, like we talked about, in most places in the United States, you can't subdivide land now if you're not a surveyor and you don't follow certain procedures. So in California, we have the Subdivision Map Act. Uh, but there are still mechanisms in the common law where you could you could have a parcel created without a surveyor, um, especially if it involves somebody that, that's a good faith purchaser, like we talked about. Okay, so again, four ways. Create a boundary by action. You're doing something on the ground. By words, that's a description and a deed. The government can create boundaries. 
and boundaries can be created under certain operations of, of the common law. All right, then he talks about some other principles related to the creation and retracement of boundaries. So what he's doing in the last part of chapter two is he's trying to help surveyors understand the difference between a survey that creates a boundary and a survey that retraces a boundary. And in my practice, 99%, eh, maybe not 99, 90% of the surveys I do are retracements. I'm not creating boundaries, I'm retracing them. You're really only creating a boundary when you're doing a land subdivision. Okay. So he says, uh, here's the, here's some notes on that, the, the ideas related, the principles related to creation and retracement of boundaries. Landowners can create boundaries in any manner that isn't illegal. Uh, and in the common law, you don't need to have a survey to create boundaries. Okay. Having said that, you know, if you're creating a boundary without a surveyor, you're, that's like no bueno. You're asking for trouble. Don't do it. <laughs> Once property rights have been granted in reference to a boundary line, the boundary line can't be modified except with mutual agreement of the parties. Browns doesn't talk about that mutual agreement of the parties, but I think he, he implies it in other parts of the chapter. So, Essentially what that means is once I create a boundary and sell somebody a parcel that, that references that boundary, I can't just go change the boundary because that's going to deprive them of property rights. So under our legal system, once the boundary is created, it, that's it. It's there. Now I can agree with the party to whom I sold after the fact to, to move the boundary. That can be done by boundary line agreement or by a lot line adjustment in California. But I can't just arbitrarily move the boundary once it's created. And the reason why is we're trying to protect that purchaser. The original surveyor creates boundaries. He doesn't ascertain them in air quotes. The retracing surveyor doesn't create boundaries. He ascertains their location from available evidence, excuse me. So that just gets back to, to what I talked about. Watch the supplemental videos. A creating surveyor defines a boundary. He doesn't retrace it. A retracing surveyor retraces a boundary that's already been created based on available evidence. Those are two different things. If you're going to be a surveyor, you got to understand the difference. The original boundaries are without error and are the exact dimensions as indicated by the creating surveyor. That's what Brown says. Um, I think it oversimplifies that a little bit. This is one of the things I, had, I struggled with a little bit in Chapter 2. So I'm going to give you some caveats. And I think Brown knows this, but he's, he's trying to keep things simple in Chapter 2 so he doesn't overwhelm the learner. So original boundaries are, are legally considered to be without error. And they are the exact dimensions as indicated by the creating surveyor. Okay, so I'm going to give you some exceptions to that rule. Junior, senior rights, so you can't sell what you don't own. So even if the original survey says 300 feet, if you only own 280 feet, you got 280 feet, you don't have 300 feet. So junior, senior rights are important. Ambiguous terms or conflicting terms. If the original survey has terms that conflict or that are ambiguous, then the dimensions might not be exactly what the surveyor says. So, uh, for example, if he, if he shows uh, two bearings and then he shows an angle and those things don't match, uh, there could be a blunder there. Uh, then, then you know, one of those things can't be true. So something's got to give. So as a general rule, Browns is correct. The original survey is without error, and the dimensions described by the original survey are control. But there's exceptions. But uh, let me give you one other quick example. Let's just say you got a deed. I think this is a really good example. Let's say you got a deed. And the deed says, it's a meets and bounds deed. And so it says, starting at an iron pipe, then it says, east along the road, east along the north line of the road, to an iron pipe. Then he says, north, Due north 50 feet. Then he goes due west 400 feet. Then he goes due south 50 feet. Now let's say you go out there and you and you do a survey and you got some old fences out here. Okay. And everything's a little bit, a little bit cocked or lean. So this is a trapezoid. You know, this isn't a huge amount. Let's say it's, uh, it's uh, thirty minutes. And lo and behold, yeah, this fence is about the same. 
It's real close. It's 29 minutes, 30 seconds. Okay, well, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to go out here and run the boundary due north? You know, you're going to survey these two mons and turn 90? No, I wouldn't do that. I would say, hey, there's some evidence to me that when this surveyor laid this out on the ground, because, you know, he was running a transit, not a total station, because of the precision of his equipment, you know, 002930s due north. And so I don't want to, because I have more precise equipment, hold this exact dimension. I'm going to try and follow the original surveyor's intent with the understanding of his equipment and, and what his equipment could do. I think Brown knows that, but if you take some of his statements in Chapter 2 and lift them right out of context, you might not, you might not get that. So you'll notice in the study notes I say, the original boundaries are without error in the exact dimensions as, as indicated by the creating surveyor, but then I add this quote from Brown's that's later in the chapter where he says, the retracing surveyor should realize that the modern methods of measurement will not duplicate the original measurements that created the original boundary. So Brown's understands what I'm talking about here. You just have to be careful. You gotta read the whole chapter and, and take it as a whole. You can't just lift parts out of context. All right, moving forward, because I'm going to run out of battery on my camera. Surveyors should retrace boundaries in the units of the original survey and consider the methods used in the original survey. So if that guy's using feet, you got to use feet. If you're using chains, you got to use chains. If you're using baras, you got to use baras. And here's another quote. Differences between the original and retracing surveys do occur because of the different methods and equipment used in obtaining the original measurements and subsequent measurements, as well as differences among the people who did the work and changes in the circumstances or conditions under which it was done. That's a direct quote. So Browns is recognizing there that we're going to have some differences because we're surveying in a different time period with different methods. And so you know you got to be smart about how you handle that. And that kind of gets back to this example on the whiteboard. Okay, last bullet point here. He says a boundary line can't be modified by a land surveyor or judge as part of a retracement survey. And that gets back to that earlier bullet point. Once the boundary is created, that's it. Unless you have mutual agreement of the parties. Okay, and so there are ways to modify boundary, a boundary under the law. A retracement survey is not one of them. You need agreement of both parties, and then in many places like California, there's a legal process that you have to go through, a land planning process, which in California, law line adjustment. So you don't get to change boundaries unless you follow certain rules and have mutual agreement of the parties. All right, just a couple uh, things I wanted to add here that, that Browns kind of made me chuckle a little bit. He talks a little bit about attorneys in here, so I have some quotes. Um, and he's talking about how today judges and attorneys don't really understand land law like they, they used to or like they should, and I believe that's true. Um, and, if, and, if, and I do a lot of work with expert witness work with attorneys. And it, I'm not knocking attorneys, and I don't think Browns is either. Attorneys have so much, like they have a huge body of knowledge to understand, just like surveyors. And so it's very hard for them to specialize in everything. And so, you know, attorneys a lot of times are, are good at basic legal, legal principles, rules of evidence, the, the rules that, and procedures that govern how litigation works in a court. And so they don't always necessarily have time to understand all the nuances of boundary law, even land attorneys. So you know, that's part of our job. Don't say, well, I'm not a lawyer. Like, if you're going to help, really help your client, you need to understand the law. You probably need to understand land law better than, than the client's attorney. And I think Browns would agree with me on that. That's why he has these quotes, which I'm, I'm not going to read them there in the study guide. Chapter 2, there you go. Watch the supplemental videos. I'm going to do one more that explains the difference between corners and monuments. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope these videos help you get through Browns.